Hey, it's Dr. Nick with the ECG Academy, and this week's Chalk Talk is a 12 lead with some basic abnormalities that everyone should be able to recognize. Coming down to the rhythm strip, there appear to be P waves and QRS complexes. And as we look across at the whole entire strip, it seems to be really quite regular. So maybe figuring out the rhythm is going to be easy this time. Well, if we look at lead three, this QRS lands on a heavy line so we can count off the rate 300, 150, 175. So it's a little bit faster than that, probably like... 78 beats per minute or thereabouts. And we should always glance between two P waves to make sure that there isn't a second P wave there because of some kind of atrial arrhythmia with two to one block. But here in lead two, the P waves are enormous and it's very easy to see that there's only one P wave for every QRS complex. So let's look more carefully at the P waves to figure out what the rhythm is. Coming up to lead one, we can see it's upright in lead one and it's also upright in AVF. So that tells us that the P waves are traveling down and towards the left. So I think it's safe to say that this is simply a normal sinus rhythm with a rate somewhere around 78 beats per minute. So now let's start looking at some intervals, zooming in a little bit. So conveniently enough, this first P wave starts on this heavy line. And if we look at the QRS complex and where it starts just past the next heavy line. So remember the heavy lines are 200 milliseconds apart. So it looks like PR interval is probably about 210 milliseconds. And that allows us to make a diagnosis of first degree AV block. Now, granted it's borderline. Some people would not notice that there's a first degree AV block, but just for the sake of being complete, Complete, we can make that diagnosis. Now, what about the width of the QRS complex? Well, you can take advantage of the fact that this QRS complex ends on a heavy line, and you can measure back and see that it's just above two small boxes, so about 90 milliseconds wide. So that's normal, but while we're looking carefully at the QRS complexes, I hope you noticed one thing. Then in lead two, the initial deflection of the QRS complex seems to go down. If the first part of the QRS goes down, we refer to that as a Q wave, but this definitely looks like a Q wave and it's more than one box wide, so that's abnormal. So since lead two is an inferior lead looking at the bottom wall of the heart, let's just scroll down and see what three and AVF look like. Look at that, here in three and here in AVF, the QRS complex goes down first before it comes up. And so what you have is a pretty deep Q wave and then a small R. And again, in AVF, we have a very deep Q wave and a small R. So if you have Q waves in two out of the three inferior leads, what does that tell you? You know, some things just pop off the page and you should store them away in your memory bank and say, oh, okay, there's this. Q waves in the inferior leads point to an inferior MI and most people will call it age indeterminate, but most cardiologists would just refer to this as an old inferior MI because you don't have any evidence of ST segment elevation or depression. So it could be a week ago, it could be a year ago. There's no telling. That's why a lot of people prefer the term age indeterminate. But these Q waves are very important and you need to be able to spot those because that suggests that the patient has had a myocardial infarction of the inferior wall at some point in the past. Let's zoom out again and figure out what the QRS axis is. You have to find the QRS complex that's most isoelectric and then you know the axis is perpendicular to that. It looks like lead two is most isoelectric. The QRSs are equal sized above and below the baseline. Lead two is 60 degrees away from lead one going down into the patient's left. So if lead two is most isoelectric, that means the axis is perpendicular to lead two. So if this is 60 degrees, then the perpendicular to that would be here at minus 30, which is a bit of a leftward axis, isn't it? But why is there a leftward axis? Well, remember, if you have infarction of the inferior wall, there's an absence of signals heading in that direction. And so more often than not, the axis shifts leftward. So a left axis deviation is a very common finding in an old inferior MI, and that's exactly what we have here. Well, now let's turn our attention to the precordial leads. So looking at V1, we have a decent R wave and a little bit of an S, but while we're here in V1, look at the P wave. We'll zoom in, and what you have is a little bit of an upward deflection, but then a predominantly negative deflection that's more than one box wide and one box deep. And so that's consistent with left atrial 
abnormality. So that's one more thing to put on the list of abnormalities here. And now as we look at the rest of the precordium, we can see the R wave grows nicely. We have the transition point here at V4 where the R wave grows taller than the S wave. And then V5 gets a little bit smaller and V6 for some reason gets very small. Now it's most often a problem with lead positioning. The Q wave in V6 is too small to be pathologic. That represents septal depolarization because remember the left bundle branch innervates the septum. And so the septum will depolarize from left to right. And so in V6, it gives us a negative deflection initially. A little tiny Q wave is a normal finding in the lateral leads. We can actually see a little tiny septal Q wave here in AVL and again in lead one. So I think that just represents septal depolarization and it's really a normal finding. Now, the one thing that we didn't measure was the QT interval. And remember when you're looking at the QT interval, you know, you should look halfway between two QRS complexes. And if the T wave goes past that point, then the corrected QTC is likely abnormal. The QT interval is about 400 or so. The calculation for the corrected QT interval is the QT interval, which is 400, over the square root of the R to R interval, it's 750. So it's the square root of 0.75. So 400 divided by the square root of 0.75, and that gives us 461. So that's just slightly long. So if you want to call it a borderline QT interval, you can do that as well. So in summary, what we have is a normal sinus rhythm with a borderline first degree AV block, a borderline QT interval, left atrial abnormality, and finally, evidence of an old inferior MI. Okay, so I hope that was a helpful exercise for you guys. The more you do this, the more comfortable you'll get identifying abnormalities and seeing kind of the big picture. And that's what's important when you're reading electrocardiograms. You want to develop a system so that you don't miss anything. Okay, so until next time, this is Dr. Nick with the ECG Academy. Thanks for watching.